corners is up. You get corners adhesive, which is like a, um, a bit like a base coat, but a lot, lot more glue. And uh, yeah, we got it up. We got little tech screws just holding it up to stop it falling and you gotta hold up there and stand there with three people for a few minutes and this last one we actually done with two people because brother in law had places to go. And uh, now I'll just sweep the floor. So sort of pretty reasonable sweep. And uh, now we're gonna look at painting the other room inside the house that was shown the plaster of a little while back. Uh, probably masking all this up, or you know, drop sheet, or part mask and rest drop sheet, or whatever, because we don't want any paint on this. This is most likely going to be oiled, almost certainly. Um, and after we mask that up, then we go paint this ceiling. And uh, yeah, but we sort of probably should be doing whatever else we can just to let this dry. The stupid packet doesn't tell you a drying time. It tells you it's workable for 30 minutes, which is a pretty big exaggeration because I reckon it's only workable for about 15 minutes, but whatever. But it doesn't tell you how long it's got to dry before you paint over it or do anything. Not that there's that much, but sometimes, like you do your corner with it and any gaps, which we've done the gap on the ceiling, but not necessarily the gaps there because of these board bow and blah, blah, blah. But uh, some of them bow a bit. But that's just the, the building moving and the stumps moving. There's, there's got to be a wood. There's probably going to be like a chimney going like right through here anyway. So you know, unless you're hanging over a wood stove, you probably won't have me seeing those gaps. But whatever. We're going to have wallpaper on this, so that might help hide a few things. But. Uh. Okay, I went and sanded the other room. It appears brother-in-law hasn't done the final coat. I think he put up the corners, and that's what he was doing in there. I thought he was doing more plastering, but we can't paint there, unfortunately. So there's a bit of a dud. So he's going to have to do the final coat on that or whatever. And uh, it have to be re sanded and repainted so that it drags it out before that's going to get painted again. It might be too good for the schedule, but, anyways, um, we've got to go and mask all this up. We'll sort of cover it anyway with a bit of black plastic. And uh, then we shall be on our way for painting. Uh, yeah. That's about how much paint you should get on your hands when you're painting. Especially with one of those. I'll show you my other hand. Not much at all. This is what we have been doing. Painting the ceiling. There's a bit of packing tape there because we didn't have any masking tape. And she'll collapse for the second time. <laughs> anyway. That's the second coat there. I didn't show you guys the first coat. Doesn't sort of matter that I've come down a bit there because it's going to be wallpapered from the corner stand, but it did matter on the timber. And uh, yeah, there's only stuff on packing tape. I think I've got about a couple of metal on that corner, maybe one eighth of an inch on that edge of the corner edge that I didn't quite get the tape onto. But Anyway, it's 15 years since I've actually used a roller, so surprised it went all so well. Um, of course, I used a uh, brush a lot during uh, in my house. I had to do the cornices of that one. Not bad, these expensive brushes, but I'm too much of a tight ass and can I do with a $2 one, so. <laughs> But that is an expensive one, it's about 30 bucks that one. So. Anyway. I heard a weird noise coming from up the tree. I don't know if you can see it. Oh, now you can hear it. Take you on the other side of the source.
Down down the road, burp, burp, burp. Chooks it up the tree. Peacocks also go up the tree, and they get their chicks up there within a couple of weeks or something, but here the chooks go up the tree, and that's where the chooks stay. Sometimes, if they feel like it. So do you notice if you don't stick them in the coops and you've got plenty of trees? And they have a nice natural little life. They sometimes decide that uh, sitting up the tree isn't a stupid idea. I spy some little imposters. Imposters. Imposters are watching me. Horse doesn't mm. feel too happy about the imposters either. Or about my high vis shirt, one or the other. What's the matter, horse, eh? They're looking just about ready to eat, actually. Yeah, man. Believe there, I bought a uh, bought a Lester Merino cross. Sort of look pretty much like that. That's apparently what they are. These are the ones that they sell as fat lambs. Cross between your meat breed from Northern England and your Australian breed of wool sheep. Pairs aren't here and it seems somebody might be stuck inside the netting. It'll work its way out. This little silver eye. Here comes the young hoss. Here we go. What's the matter, buddy? Hey? <laughs> Look at this suburban shirt. Upsets him. <laughs> ah, poor little silver eye. And it'll work its way out. Okay, enough of that gay stuff. Um, I wanted to show you the rainwater system on this. As you can see, we've got a roof there. This is just the barn I'm sleeping in. This has more become just a big storage area for junk. And there's a guttering for it. Straight into that. Not much as you can see. There's your overflow. Somewhere I should be able to find. Uh, not terribly sure, but could be up against the actual house side, uh, the barn side rather. There's a tap anyway. It's plumbing through. Yeah, quite possibly that line there. Look at me foot on. It's uh, plumbed through into that tap there. And instead it runs the right. I mean, it's pretty full because it hasn't been used for so long. But um, I think that's me out water. Don't know exactly where it goes to. And I suggest my incoming line may have a bit of a leak. With all the algae on the flame and wall. Um, but all the same, like it's still under quite good pressure uh, because of the rain. It doesn't seem to really run out that much. It was last year when everybody was living there, and then they had to siphon from that tank there to this one. And it literally meant just putting a garden hose on the bottom of the connection of that one and just running it straight in the top of this. and. Fortunately, you know, a bit of an embankment here, um, you know, that one was higher and just, yeah, we well, didn't even siphon, it just come down over the pure fact that it's probably about four foot taller. Uh, and then you'd get more water for your tap in there. Yeah. Horsey.
a little bit foggy at the section. Ooh, that's actually pretty early. Uh, take a work out when the sun comes up often enough. Sometimes I slip a bit more, sometimes I don't. Mm. The other horse is just around the corner. Where is she? Man should have missed it. That's what I tell all the girls my place is called, the Mansion of Mystery. They'll look at me like that. Ooh. Okay, we've finished the second coat. We've vacuumed most of the floor and we've been putting in a bit of a bit more expansion foam to fill the gaps. And uh, we are about to socket to it with a big belt sander. Alright, on the move. About 10 minutes, my sister reckons that it's going to rain, so I had to get on me washing off the line. Um, yeah, got to get tools inside. What we've done today was, uh, let's stop the throat. Was go and put a bit of liquid nails in between the gaps. Um, I done the final coat on the ceiling. And put some liquid, uh, oh, then I sanded the floor, then we put liquid nails to fill the gaps so air wouldn't come up through the floor, then we put a layer of Estopol, which is a oil modified polyurethane. And I've uh, still got liquid nails mixed with turfs, it's also going tacky on the movies. So, uh, anyway, I've got to put some tools away. All this liquid nail comes out on that side, they're trying to cover it. Where they smack the chimney in today, the roof is just going to be whole now. Brother and all was doing that while I was sanding the floor, and now we've got to hurry up. Beautiful. It's one of three coats. Yeah. Beats. Water and down shellac far too fast, then realising that if you water it down it isn't as strong, and then trying to do three coats, blah 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 blah. Anyway, a few more coats of this. Looks bloody beautiful. Groovy. Lazy pooch. Pretty certain it's a chook from last year. It's the oldest one of the lot anyway. This is the same coop I had last year. Um, so you got like a triangle frame, but up here... Here's your actual little coop coop. She'd go up there for a bit of warmth because it was all enclosed because of this and the fact that heat rises and all that. <sighs> My sister was certain this was a holly bush. This oh, ginormous shite storm. But I believe it to be an Oregon grape because I saw one for sale. I don't know if I've already mentioned this. I probably have. But yeah. I believe this to be an Oregon grape because I saw one for sale with the same sort of things in there. Oh, it's a holly bush. You know, four or five berries and you're poisoned, and yet the peacock eats the blooming berries off at all the time. There's one of them. It's another peacock down near the plums more. I have to look it up and see if you can eat Oregon grapes, and I might be going home with a whole bunch full of Oregon grapes. They're right now, but they're starting to turn, they're starting to get too ripe. It's a bloody big plant anyway. Might be a few plants, I don't know. I don't know, but underneath there there's a hollow and they've got a couple more chicken coops. Yeah, some of them are you know, saggy and the others are still all right.
<sighs> I think it's that chuck there, the grass they didn't tell where to get it out. <laughs> That's funny. Horse walking off. I notice the peacock comes up to the horse shit and starts pecking in the horse shit, so I don't know if there's something that's uh, undigested grains in it or bugs going through it or what, but this, we have a phenomenal amount of bugs here, like, turn a lot at night and you get these big bugs that are like, holy smoke, they're like three quarters of an inch long, and you get small ones that are just through the, the chook there before that are like tiny little ones, they almost look like rat shit from a distance because they're all black. Yeah. Gives me ideas of experiments, and uh, I may end up getting a chook when we get back. Where we'll see. There's the tree where the chooks usually perch. We don't use real or something. There's big piles of chook shit all over the blooming lower branches. Groovy. Now a little bit on the ground. <laughs> Not a tree you want to be under for shade. Well, this is your government food rations during the Greater Depression. This is all you're going to get. Now, this is potato starch and water. This was the um, wallpaper mix, and uh, bugs got into it just because they're all through the damn house, attracted by the lights at night, and we have heaps of bugs here. And uh, as I've already said, and uh, this was supposed to be used for wallpaper a few days ago, but she's a little bit beyond it. And the red spots may indicate it's actually getting a little bit mouldy, but anyway. Now it's chook food. All I'm going to do is just go. There we go, chooks will take care of that later. <sighs> Yummy! I'm going to get it all out. Now it's just potato starch and water, so it's effectively like potato flour mixed with water. And if you were to actually bake this, it'd be not a great deal different from uh, mashed potato, I suppose. Yummy! I know what the bubble function is, but it's on. I'm just being convinced to get an automatic washing machine since she's seen this. When this thing spins out, I'm not joking, the veranda on the other side of the house starts vibrating. <laughs> so she, yeah, definitely uh, shakes things up a bit. But, uh, this is the sort of stuff that I can't expect to have living off grid. Not with a small system I've got anyway. If you get a big monster system, if you're going to spend thirty thousand dollars plus on a solar system, yeah, you can run this sort of stuff directly. But it's, uh, I can't believe it. it's got such a digital screen. A few of these mushrooms coming up. They're getting eaten pretty quick by bugs. Put another coat of ester pole on that floor, and now I've got to remove that and the entire flu kit and find a bit of corrugated iron to replace it so got the old impact driver and uh, we'll see how we go that's probably the longest antenna I've ever seen on a flipping grasshopper he's absolutely tiny, he's probably only a quarter inch long he's the antenna about an inch long well there we are This is badly hot. I mean, this is about 60 degrees Celsius. It's hot enough to just about flame and cook eggs up here. I'm not joking. It starts to burn your hands if you touch it for any more than about three quarters of a second. It's really that bad. Um, yeah, got her out. They had another sheet overlapping the top, so the original sheet and then the flashing and then another sheet overlapping the flashing and that sheet that was overlapping the flashing is now your under sheet there and you can see where it goes rusty and then you've got another inch or two that's also the same sheet that you can see now covering the hole 
because of course you've got to have your first sheet here on the top and then any water flows down it's only ever going to drop downwards so you've got to put it underneath because if you put it above then it would just catch in the top of that sheet on the end of that sheet and then just drip inside um, so yeah I uh, had to get the brother-in-law inside to try and push up the batten but I had enough length hanging out the end as I was pushing it up that I actually managed to jump the whole lot myself just by pushing down a bit as I was pushing up and jumped it over so here you actually didn't end up doing anything and then I've got the ones in this batten but this sheet oh, probably comes about here or something and uh, yeah of course it's attached to the batten there and it had to be and those ones there and uh, I've got new screw, I've one new screw there and a few new screws in the top. One of the original ones lost a seal. I've probably put in more than was originally there. Um, yeah, anyway, I am bloody bacon, so I've got to get off here and I might show you inside. Oh, holy smoke. That is badly, badly hot up there. That was at least 65 degrees, which is about burn me hands touching that. Yeah, here we go. There's your new one. And you can see there, to overlap the batten. Um, and yeah, it's actually longer than I thought. That's about a foot and a half past the bat, and I thought it was only going to be like six inches or something. But yeah, so anyway, there's the old wood heater there with the creosote. Creosote Deluxe. I'm going to get some water and pour it on the roof and show you steam coming off the roof. It is that hot up there? I reckon I can do it. There's all the creosote. It's your little guard. Here's your thing. Um, this is your double walled one when the sun plays well. There you go, double walled. Um, and yeah, it comes through to your little witch's hat, and all you've got is a strip of stainless around the side there. And often these are stainless. Some of these don't even have this guard around the side. There is no chicken wire, uh, not chicken wire, like fly screen mesh, brass fly screen mesh, or anything like that that you have as a spark arrestor in the States. We we don't have those. In fact, absolutely none of the flues have them, whether you're using propane or or wood heating. But uh, I might wash my hands and I'll pour a little bit of water on the roof and you'll see the steam coming straight off. And this gives you an idea of really how hot it is. Oh, look, you see it drying off the roof. I don't know if you can actually see it or not. I'm going to have to play this back later because I'm under so much glare here. You can't even see me on screen. There we go. On the left side there, it's dried up. And you should be able to see the rest of it. Literally drying as it goes. If you can see it, I can see a little bit of possibly steam. It's going to be some form of steam. I mean, it's not running down there that fast. It's literally just. Let's get a fingerprint of water. I'll put it on here. And away it goes. It's disappearing pretty quick. Finger again. Yeah. Give me cap over. Amazing, just seeing it spinning like that straight away. Incredibly hot out here, but anyway, I might have to go and have a drink and draw on it myself. Bit more than time. Called the 50s. Chisel attachment. I'm going 
to move all this rubble and lintel and crap. Plums. Put plums in boiling water for about two minutes. And all the skins will split. And then you get rid of the skins and the pulp goes in there with the seeds. Later on you put it through a sieve, the pulp will go through the sieve, of course the seeds won't. And you've got pure pulp. And original product. I've done around 85% of dragging this out. Believe it or not, we've still got more flame and hell to <laughs> hard slog after the moon, too. You watch. We had a little volcano incident. Lost a bit. Nobody was watching it. But it's pretty much cooked. A little bit chunky, but it's pretty much cooked. I'll show you the next part of, of the process. Come on. What are you doing? That's the next part of the process. We can have baking uh, paper. In this case, we're using uh, plastic freezer paper because there is a particular film, this thing here, which is sort of reusable, that you can put the um, puree into and it'll sort of come out like when the puree is dehydrated it comes out like um, a product called roll-ups that I can remember eating as a kid one of the few <laughs> sugary things I've got my hands on as a kid and uh, it's basically yeah you dehydrate the pulp and you peel off sheets of it and um, eat it in chunks, and it literally peels off as a whole sheet. And uh, heat for this dehydrator comes through the side and through the middle here. And um, I think we have the device behind us. I think I've already showed it. Anyway. Oh yeah, that's your top lid for it too. And that there is the device heating element and whatnot underneath and you get a little fan which uh, blows the air up through the middle and I'm pretty certain it will blow it up through the side there because that piece is slightly elevated against that 500 watt 240 volt um, I'm certain there'd be smaller ones in the market that are only probably be 200 watt but I don't need one because I've got a great big solar powered one that seems to work even on overcast days okay well there we go Hearth come out. It was the bricks had actually sunk down, and the hearth was still sitting there, probably about I don't know, two inch of concrete sitting on its own. Um, and the hole was somewhere around here, and uh, yeah, that's where the chimney was starting to collapse more on that side. And there's quite a chance that some of the hole may have been caved in by the weight of all this. Um, but some of these things over time they sink anyway and between the half and the bricks on the top it was probably well you know it would have been oh, shit, three inch gap or so but anyway we've got this below the floor joist and at a later point there's going to be form work put in here probably I don't think when I'm here don't know probably not uh, there's going to be form work put in and then more concrete poured and this may be thumped a bit with a sledgehammer just to settle some of it or something before that point and uh, yeah that's a general plan what I tried to show before was a little chick which is under there somewhere couldn't really see camera done the standard old crap it always seems to do silhouettes when there's any bright light and uh, yeah but a little tiny black chick under there and uh, <laughs> ran away from the mother at first and then I managed to 
lean down and try and push it backwards and that sort of accepted the mother by the looks. Uh, I was tweeting for a while and saying that, yeah, little one that only looked like it hatched today or something like that, or maybe last night or whatever. It's, uh, a lot of this is bricks on the top, but as you get down lower, and especially on the edges, on the outer edges, it's all like old stones and stuff. You can see one of them there. That's a stone. A few of these ones you probably can't see too well. They're stones as well, but uh, that was today's job. And uh, well, look, ah, you see a little bit of light there. That's uh, where the old hole was. Just a few roof sheets tacked on there, and uh, there's a temporary measure until, well, it all gets opened up and a flue gets put through, which. Um, oh, they've got an individual flue kit for this one, a new flue kit. The flue I took down today is for the um, wood stove in the kitchen. So, yeah. This is how we do it. Dun, 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 dun. A little bit of this is a bit lumpy. We could have put it in a bellini, which is like one of those thermo cook or whatever the heck it's called, uh, which sort of blends it as well as cooks it. but. We boiled it and we didn't boil it enough because it sort of blew over so it may be slightly lumpier which just means it's not a consistent mm. perfect level thing and of course it's not going to be like that if we're sort of putting it on by hand anyway. Um, <coughs> yeah, here we go, this is the second layer going down now. And bang. Put them there, land it over because they all stack into each other. Stack another one on. And continue on. I believe this one is the one that come with the device. Um, it's actually part of the dealio. Here's another one that come with it. This is mesh, but if it's going to fall through that, it's probably too fine anyway, and you should be using something like that because the mesh that is built into it is reasonably fine already. Um, yeah. Probably should be showing this. This is the neighbours. It's a Yanmar, Philippine made. I know they make a lot of diesel stuff. Some sort of big flywheel, big teeth cog, with its own alternator. It's some sort of a radiator. Speed adjustment, direct injection. I don't know if it is actually a diesel or what. May indeed be a diesel. Yeah, it's a diesel. Hmm. There we go, she's running. Easy Dry Snack Maker FD 500. Set on medium. Feel the hot air blowing out of the top there. Hmm. This is a pretty good brand too. It's not an old crap though. It's a really quite a good brand. But there's Cambrook or one of the cheaper brands, and you can buy the the rings of fat, and they're almost identical, and they fit in, so you can stack a few extras in. Here's of my man. I shouldn't annoy you too much. Um, unfortunately, we can't see it, but the chick has been out and about walking through the grass. Day old chick following her around. Every now and then she will sort of squat down and sit on it to protect it or whatever, and then up they'll go and walk around a bit again. Hmm. Unfortunately, I haven't seen it right now, but I may show it later. Well, right there, people, is the finished product. This one uh, okay. didn't go so good. It's off your proper professional one. It doesn't seem to go too good maybe because it was too thin, maybe because the plastic is so damn thick. 
Um, you can see it's not 100% boiled there because we've got the thicker patches where there's more and then the less where there's you know, more juice and less pulp. And that obviously is what happens when you don't fully blend it, but that doesn't mean it's any worse. It just means it's thicker and thinner. Yeah, here's what happens when it comes out on the freezer sheets and then you can just peel it off like that and it's, uh, yeah you can almost see through it but that's a whole lot better than eating plain plums if you've eaten so damn many like everybody here has including me <laughs> you kind of get sick of them and you're trying to work out how to process them and you can do jam but then again you know uh, due to the brother's mother-in-law uh, due to the brother's mother we have brother-in-law's mother whatever we have so much jam it's just about beyond the joke and still using it from last year so as they say more than one way to skin a cat and more than one way to cook a plum and, and this is probably uh, or preserve a plum and, and this is probably one of the better ways if not the best way here it is and there's not too happy there we go it's about as close as we probably should get Tiny little black ball of fluff. Let's see if it walks there, guys. After Mama. All right, buddy. There we go. Bagged and packed. If uh, you really want, you could probably put one of those um, uh, desiccant in there, just to keep it dry for sure. There's one that's sort of been flattened a little bit and then rolled up circular. Uh, that one said the air squeezed out of it a bit. The other way to squeeze that air is water bath. You would actually stick the bottom part of the bag in water and it'll squeeze all the air out and then you've got to seal it. But you've got to be careful that you don't get water in there, which can defeat the purpose if you screw up. There's a little chick there you can see. <laughs> Mission started, pound sauce. Just in the river area down here in a neighbouring town. I've got to do a bit of uh, shopping, get some money out of the bank, you know, basically get ready for uh, the trip back. So I've got a bit of a few packets of biscuits or whatever in the car, pizza shapes or whatever, a couple of Red Bulls. I'm flipping do with a Red Bull myself today, to be honest. I might have one myself. Oh, this camera's great. Acorn tree. Considering they're coming out, I might go to a town not too far from me and uh, in a while and um, when I get back home and pick a bunch and show you how to cook them for eating. Sort of almost make a flour out of them. Remember this from last year. This joint is drowned in flipping dandelion. All the grass is full of dandelion. And we bought plantain. And where are we here? You, you got your acorns, and over there, it's blood plums. There's one there. There's another one there. There's quite a lot of plums actually over there. There's a little bridge up ahead. I might walk over and we'll have a look, but. I should be shopping, but oh, who cares? I've got all day to do that. That is definitely it there. And I think a lot of this is the same thing. Bloody on steroids compared to what we have at home. And that, the best of what we got would only have a leaf three quarters the size of that. And yet that leaf is pretty about the same size as all of them around here. Um, and here it is down by the uh, river bank as well. All the, black, uh, the brown seeded stuff you can see here. That's a scotch thistle. I don't know what that is. All this stuff here. It's all either common dock or curly leaf dock. It's apparently very hard to tell the difference. Uh, i got some good ribwort plantain yet again. That's hopeless for eating. You can't eat it. That's the one that I got at my place and you dig up the root and the root's like a carrot. It's like a yellow carrot. I mean, honestly, it really looks like a carrot. 
um, and it's good for using for dyeing clothes, like dyeing cotton and stuff like that. And it comes out this sort of um, yellow and yellow orangish colour, I would assume. Like, I look at my sister's place, and as far as I'm concerned, they've got a severe problem with it. They're not worried about it, but, like, I'd be screaming if it was my place because they've got a lot of this against their river as well, and they've got a fair bit of it even amongst the, the grass. And it's one of those things where you spray it, it'll kill the top. Next year, it comes back like nothing happened because it's got all this stored energy in the root, and the root will stay alive because it's like a damn carrot and then it, up you go again and you, you're back to uh, square one. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, there is broadleaf plantain. A certain person from New York showed me a bit of this uh, in, on Dandenong Mountain in Melbourne, in the capital, state capital. It was nothing like this. This stuff looks like it's absolutely on drugs. The leaves they had, they were getting were about this big. That is three times the size, and I thought there was a broadleaf plantain down here, and I'm obviously right. That one is edible, quite edible. Um, I don't know how it tastes. You ribwort plantain, that's edible. It tastes like shit. It's also good to have clean leaves, and if you get a root, uh, wound, sort of roll the clean leaves to sort of let the sap come out or whatever or just basically put it on the wound and then put a bandage over the top of it and apparently it's um, got antibacterial properties and wherever it is you won't get bacteria uh, which is good for you know packing cuts and whatnot and I have actually done that myself previously and uh, yeah it's uh, Everybody else sees nothing, and I see a whole cornucopia of usable stuff. Dandelion, you know, broadleaf plantain, dock, uh, ribwort plantain, you know, acorns back there, plums over there, water hens. You can eat them if you want. I think it's illegal, but pretty certain it's illegal. But uh, probably tastes like chicken. Probably tastes like wild duck, which means it tastes like shit. But but uh, there's another option there. As you get higher north, you get a lot of different things uh, growing in the water as well. And there's a, a certain rivers right up north where they have uh, what they call duck potatoes, uh, and also. Tarot, is it? One of them ones. And they fest all the rivers up north. Over in Asia, they're eating them like they're going out of fashion, and we're declaring them as weeds. <laughs> it's, we're, we're too English still to eat them, you know what I'm saying? Once again, I'm sure some of my European viewers will know what these are. I think I've seen them before. Don't know what they're called. The interesting thing about this joint is. Because this is so cool up here and they get a bit of snow, a lot of the British that come here back in the day were used to the temperatures here, even though for Australia this is considered rather cold. Um, another interesting thing is a river here. You see platypus all the time. Brother-in-law says when he's out fishing they're like a dime a dozen. And he sort of doesn't like them because when platypus gets going, all the fish disappear. Um, and it's quite common, very common to see platypus. I mean, if he was to go fishing every day, you would see one every second day. Uh, and apparently along this river in the early morning or late afternoon, you'll see them swimming along the surface. Interesting thing is when the, they got a... I've only ever seen a platypus dead on a riverbank. That's the only ones I've seen in the wild because um, we don't really have them very much at all really where I'm oh we do have them technically they're there but you're not going to see them very often uh, there's only a few of them along the river near me but around here they're very common 
as I was saying, when they first sent one back to England, the British were so certain that they'd got a duck and merged it with, like, a beaver or a possum or something, you know, something like that. They really thought it was a duck merged with a beaver. Um, or some sort of a combination that had been stitched together. So they literally cut it open to find where the stitches were inside the animal because they were so certain that they'd been sent a fake that had been stitched together and they were going to find where the stitches were inside. Talk about setting your ways of thinking, you know. And of course they found no stitches and uh, it was quite remarkable to think that there was a animal that was not a bird that had a bill. And a uh, little known thing about platypuses is you don't want to pick the damn things up either because they've got these spurs behind their back legs, I think it is, and they can sting you in it. And there's a guy who, you know, former Vietnam vet who um, had actually taken shrapnel in Vietnam. He got hit by shrapnel and he... Of course, years later, was out with his son fishing along a river like this. It was an old log floating in the river, or not floating, but on the side of the river or whatever, just stuck in the water. Um, quite a large one. This platypus was sunbaking on the log, and that boat came up beside the log, and he said, ah, oh, it's dead. I'll just take it off and throw it in the water or pick it up and have a look at it. And the platypus freaked out because it was sleeping, and he picked it up. And, of course, when they freak out, first thing they do is go to stick the spur into you or one of their spurs into you. And this thing got him in the arm, injected the blooming poison or whatever, and he said his arm swelled up, you know, three times the size. It was like a blooming football, as big as a football stuck, you know, his arm swelled up to. And he said the pain in that bite was worse than when he took shrapnel in Vietnam. Um, so... If you're ever a tourist and you get to come over here and you see them when you're out fishing on a river, for the love of God, don't pick the damn things up. So you want to go at it? Do so you shopping and drive off on the tractor? Interesting story behind this one. It's a street in this town called Maybe Street. When they first come to survey this place, it was just sort of a bit ramshackle, a bit temporarily set up. The surveyor wrote in the streets that he knew of. There was another street that sort of had houses, but they weren't exactly well arranged and it was a bit all spread out. So he thought, well, maybe it's a street, maybe it's not. So he just wrote in, maybe street, because he wasn't really sure if it was a proper street because of the lack of houses, if it was going to last, um, you know, and it was only a rough dirt track. So he wrote it in as Maybe Street. And back at the official office, they drew it in officially and called it Maybe Street. <laughs> Weird things happen in Australia like that. Uh, like when we get a snake, we don't name the snake after who found it. We call it Brown Snake because it's brown as opposed to the dude who named it, or who first found it, is Snake. You know, it won't be called, you know, Night Snake, or Richakov's Snake, or some guy's name Snake. It'll just be called Brown Snake. And there's been a lot of accidents and mistakes made that have just stuck as permanent names. And uh, there's ones where the surveyors have named the towns after their daughters, because the town didn't have a name previously. One guy had four daughters, named all these particular towns, one each after his daughters, sort of thing. So there's four towns are all named after his four daughters. Funny things happen in the early days surveying this country, and this is one example. <laughs>